Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, it's, uh, it's such a blessing to be back together for our Wednesday night studies, and what a joy to see all of you out there and uh, to understand that we are diving into one of the most exciting books in Scripture. And that's a big statement, but I think I can say it pretty uh, without reservation. Because as I have studied and studied, and the more that I study, the more I recognize the depth and the breadth of this book. And so I'm excited about that. Uh, I'm excited to see what the Lord will do through this book of Daniel. Tonight we're going to do a general introduction just to kind of familiarize you with the surroundings, uh, the landscape of the book, the warp and woof of all that we're going to be looking at for the next several weeks. So if you would turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Daniel, I would appreciate that. Turn to Daniel chapter 1 and verse 1. And you'll notice uh, on your bulletins on the second to back page, you have an outline for our message as always with our title, which I've titled a momentous introduction and also our, our outline there. And this is indeed a momentous introduction. I, I have always been fascinated with the book of Revelation. Uh, one of my favorite professors that Jim and I share in common, uh, Dr. Robert Thomas, wrote a commentary on Revelation that is the magnum opus of his life and really the standing hallmark version of a commentary for that great book. And I've loved it and I've looked at it and I continue to be marvel to marvel at it. And yet as I look at Daniel, in many ways, I think there is more depth and there's more complexity in Daniel because Revelation is effectively all fulfillment of the prophetic past. Daniel deals with a historic element and then carries us forward into prophecy. So there's a forward and backward element to it. And of course, all happening prior to the first revelation of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ at His birth. And so, so much that is being brought forward in these wonderful verses. Um, and I think you will find this is indeed a, a momentous introduction. And let's first put Daniel into its context in the Bible. Daniel is the last of the major prophets. And I've listed for you there on the screen above us the, the, the listing of those prophets, uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel, the length of those books by chapters as well, and the dates of the writing, another very important part. Now notice that when we think of major and minor prophets, it is not a function of the importance of what they wrote. It strictly reflects the length of the writing. And yet isn't it interesting that as we consider Daniel as the end of the major prophets, that it is only 12 chapters in length. Two of the minor prophets are actually longer than Daniel, that the book of Hosea and Zechariah, both 14 chapters. So it's, it's interesting to understand that. And it's also important to recognize some of the details of these dates. We see Isaiah the prophet wrote from 739 to 680 BC, the first major prophet and his proclamation to Israel. Jeremiah wrote from 627 to 570. We're going we're gonna to want you to kind of keep some of these dates in mind because there's so much historically and futuristically that applies to Daniel. So you'll want to kind of keep your eye on a few of these dates. Ezekiel then from 593 to 570, and Daniel, our book, from 605 to 536. You notice immediately that Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel write concurrently. So these three prophets are writing at the same time. Jeremiah remains in Jerusalem, where the Lord continues to give him revelation to call out to the children of Israel and particularly to the tribes of Judah and Benjamin that they must repent and turn. 
Ezekiel, on the other hand, is taken off in the second exile. You'll note, and we'll show shortly and talk more about, there are three exiles that happen through the final destruction of Judah and Benjamin, the southern two tribes. And Ezekiel is taken in the second wave of deportation. He is taken along with the exiles to a place outside of Babylon, uh, somewhat of a, of a camp, if you will. And it's uh, a place that is alongside the river Kibar. And Ezekiel has a very unique role in his prophecy. And he comes out of a priestly background where he expected to be the one who would next stand in the temple and be able to carry forth those special services such as the Day of Atonement and the uh, continual maintenance of the showbread and the lighting of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the candle and all of these different aspects, the continual burning of the incense on the altar. But now he's taken and whisked away, and so also is Daniel. And we'll see much more about the timing of that as we move along. Now, there's another element that we need to recognize that I mentioned a moment ago, that Daniel is a hinge. He is the end of the major prophets and the beginning of the minor prophets. It's important that we understand that location, and in understanding it, we also want to understand the order of these books because it helps us not only when your pastor says turn to Habakkuk and, um, or Habakkuk, however you would like to say it, and um, rather than finding it immediately or fumbling through your Bible, and we have to turn to Matthew Reed, who's our resident expert in the book, so that we know where to go and get a page number. So I want to give you just a little more information on that the minor prophets, uh, they're alphabetical or sort of. So I'm going to give you a little view into the convoluted workings of my mind and you'll probably all be wishing that you hadn't had to have that uh, journey. But there are three things that help me and they're sort of alphabetical to remember the order of the minor prophets. The first thing you have to remember is the first and last book. If you don't have that, you're... this. This isn't going to make sense. It may not make sense anyway. But you have to remember, Hosea is the beginning, and Malachi, the great Italian prophet, is the last. So we have Hosea and Malachi as our bookends to the minor prophets. So now, the next thing we need to remember is that the pro this alphabetical order is a function of the consonants primarily. Not A, E, I, O, or U, the vowels, but the consonants. So if we start through our alphabet and we start moving through to find the first that are, consonant that's a prophet, it's not B, C, D, F, G, it's H. It's Hosea. Hosea is our first book. And what follows H? It is J. So H and then J is Joel. And you say, well, pastor, there's two J's. There's Joel and Jonah. They are alphabetical in the way that they sit. So remember H and then J, Hosea and then Joel. The next thing to remember after Hosea and Malachi is the J and J sandwich. I know you're going to want to get this all, all on tape and this is going to go, you know, viral. Um, I'm not sure where, but... The J and J sandwich between Joel and Jonah are the only two vowel prophets. And they are A and O, the Alpha and Omega. They're Amos and Obadiah. Okay, perfect, isn't it? I knew you were right with me. And the last thing that you need to remember as we move along, well, first you see as we go from H to J, and then we go, is there a K? No, an L? No, an M? Yes, there's an M. Okay, our M is Micah. What about Malachi? We already got that dialed. It's the last one. So we have Micah. And after M is N, Nahum. And after Nahum, the last thing you have to remember, just to recap for you all, because I know you don't want to miss a beat here, Hosea and Malachi, beginning and end, J and J sandwich, and then, drum roll please, H, K, pair. An H, K, pair. Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah. They're the HK pair. And there you have such a simple way 
or maybe not, to remember Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. <laughs> yeah, you can come up with a much more convoluted system of your own that will probably work. But this works for me. But it is important for us to understand this because, again, there is a connectivity, and we're going to see more of that connectivity as we go along. But let's dive to our introduction here just so that we can uh, keep moving along and you don't come and bring the men in the white coats to carry me out, which is probably what should happen. So we need to, to recognize some of these aspects of what's going on, and this is our outline for tonight, uh, the prophetic itinerary, the prophetic individuals, and the prophetic infrastructure. And let's take a look at our first verse of Daniel and uh, understand where this comes from. Read along with me in your Bibles, if you would. Daniel 1 and verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah... Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Our three points of our outline come immediately in order out of verse 1. The first thing we have is the itinerary, the time frame, the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah. We'll talk a bit more about who Jehoiakim is, and how he fits into this whole scheme. Again, a very important facet because this is where Judah has culminated in their wickedness. We'll see that Israel has already been taken captive because of their wickedness. And Judah should have learned. If you see your older brother get a serious spanking for breaking or putting a dent in mom's car, you want to make sure you don't do the same. Well, that's what Judah should have done because Israel got a serious spanking from the Lord as they were carried to captivity, but they did not learn. In fact, Ezekiel tells us that Judah's wickedness was even greater than was Israel's. So we understand that there should have been a, a time of learning, but there wasn't. And so as we come to the end of this captivity, the players are very important because we see God's divine providence in all that he did through each of these individuals. And we see Daniel beginning in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim. And so we see the itinerary and then the individuals to begin with, both Jehoiakim and Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, are our two primary characters. We'll see many more as we move along. Of course, Daniel and his friends and others. The final element is just the infrastructure and how this all sets up and what connects all of these things together. So uh, I want you to just recognize those details as we move along. Now, as we establish uh, our timeline, we also want to consider Je King Jehoiakim and how he became king. This slide shows us the last five kings of the kings of Judah before the exile. Josiah was the last good king of Judah. He changed, he went through major reformation. He had the nation, after he had cleansed all of the land of the high places, after he had torn down and destroyed all the Baals and all of the Asherim, he reinstituted the Passover. And the scripture tells us that no one had done the Passover like Josiah did. So he was a very important king. We see his dates there from 641 to 609. Remember the importance of our date in Daniel. Daniel was written. He began his ministry. He was carried captive in 605. Don't lose track of that date. 605 BC is very important. So just four years after Josiah's death, what happened to good King Josiah? He got a little full of himself and he decided he was going to go take on the Egyptian army. And the Pharaoh of Egypt said, Josiah, king of Judah, go home. I have no argument with you. And Josiah says, I'm taking you down. Well, it didn't work that way. And Josiah is killed in that battle. So then his son Jehoahaz is made king. 
Notice the huge reign of Jehoahaz. Three months. Didn't go too great for him. He, he in 609, is killed. And then Jehoiakim is made king. Interestingly, Jehoiakim was Josiah's oldest son. Jehoahaz was his second son. Notice the reign of Jehoiakim from 609 to 598. I've put his name Eliakim in, in uh, parentheses there because Jehoahaz was killed by the king of Egypt also. Was taken captive actually and we're not told exactly when he was killed but we assume it was during his transport to Egypt. So Eliakim was then put in as the new king by the king of Egypt. And he then said, you're going to pay me, you as the nation of Judah, the southern two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, you're going to pay me a whole bunch of money. And he wanted several hundred talents, pounds of gold and silver every year. We, we see then that it is through 605 that Jehoiakim is the one that is king. Notice his kingship goes clear to 598. We'll see a bit more about that in just a second. It states, we've got 605 there in bold in parentheses because this is when Daniel began, when Daniel was taken captive, and Jehoiakim was taken captive with him. So Daniel, his friends, and Jehoiakim are taken captive. By the way, you will find the details for all of this, and please note these two sections in your scripture. This is a little homework for you. 2 Kings 23 and 24, and 2 Chronicles 36. 2 Chronicles 36 and 2 Kings 23 and 24. They detail in just a few paragraphs all of the transition from Josiah all the way through to Zedekiah. Jehoiachin began to reign in 608. We have there in parentheses. That's because he was, his, uh, his father, Jehoiakim, was taken captive in 605. He was a co-regent with his father. So there's often times, and if you take the kings, the chronology of the kings of Israel and Judah, and you start placing them all end to end, you'll find out they don't line up. And the reason is because there's often an overlap of the kings and they call that a co-regency. And as one is starting to get older, the other one is brought in and made king. We see it with David and Solomon. Solomon was made king before David died and that was the normal plan of succession because if you didn't do it that way, you basically had a civil war and an anarchy and the brothers waging war to see who would be king. So in 608... Jehoiachin was then brought in and he reigned until 597. That's another important date. We'll get to it. That is the next captivity, the second. He died in 561. Zedekiah was the last king. He was made king in 597. Nebuchadnezzar is the one who installed him as king. Nebuchadnezzar also installed Jehoiachin, Jehoiakim's son, as king, and then took him captive. Zedekiah was put in as king, and he is the king that is the final king of Israel, or of Judah, and the one who had one of the most horrific deaths. Again, you'll read about that in the other texts. So this is something that we, we recognize as the transition of the individuals who were in power through this different period. So as we consider this note, Daniel's 70 weeks is connected in these different facets. I told you there were three different captivities. Here they are. The first captivity in 605 BC is when Jehoiakim, Daniel, and the others are taken to Babylon. I mentioned Jeremiah is the prophet in Jerusalem. Ezekiel is in the prophet out in the camp along the river Kibar. Daniel is taken into the capital city in Babylon where he will prophesy. The second captivity is in 597 BC where Jehoiachin and Ezekiel 
and others are taken captive. If we flashed back, you would notice the importance of those dates down in, uh, in Jehoiachin's uh, ministry in his time as king. The third and final destruction of Jerusalem was in 586 B.C. This is where Nebuchadnezzar had had enough. And he sent his army and they leveled the temple mount. And they burnt the temple. And the fire was so hot that the gold that Solomon had put around the temple was melting and running down through the rocks and down through into the underground areas below the temple. And then he came back another time following that and destroyed the walls and leveled all of the city. So Jerusalem was turned into a heap exactly as we see in many of the prophets. So important for us to understand all of these details and also see that 605 becomes a critical time period because it is the beginning of Jeremiah's prophecy that talked about the 70 years that Israel or that Judah would be in captivity. Some have said, oh, that doesn't happen until 586 at the end. No, that's not the proper chronology. The 70 years that we'll see mentioned in Daniel chapter 9, which leads us into the 70 weeks, one of the most incredible prophetic timetables that tells us specifically down to the day, and we'll get to that, of Messiah's birth and his final being given over, all triggers off 605 B.C. So very important dates for us to keep our minds around. Daniel 9 and verses 1 to 2 is where that 70 years is mentioned. Look at one other slide that reflects the timetable of all of the prophets. <clears throat> Notice the, the prophets are given here. I know this is very small and this is all of the prophets and the times at which they ministered. You see those that were ministering through this period of Daniel and of the exile. And they are Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Daniel, and Ezekiel. Uh, by the way, this chart comes from uh, Dr. MacArthur's study Bible. If you have that Bible, uh, you could turn to page 9 in that Bible right now. And if you don't have one, I'm not here as a salesman for uh, the Lockman Foundation or for John MacArthur and his study Bible, but you will find this a very valuable resource as we're going through the book of Daniel. So you might consider that, and uh, I know that you would find it a good resource. And many of these things that I brought up already uh, came from, secondarily, either from the verbiage of uh, Dr. MacArthur's study Bible. It is, it's a great resource. So we see these different prophets and the times at which they're ministering. And we want to notice that Jeremiah has this reference and that he references some of the kings that we just looked at showing his proximity. We also see that Ezekiel mentions Daniel by name three different times. You can go to Ezekiel chapter 14 and verse 14, and Ezekiel 14 and 20, both of which speak of Daniel the prophet, and also Ezekiel 28, 3, 14, 14, and 14, 20, and 28, 3. We also find that the book of Hebrews in the New Testament in chapter 11 in verses 32 and 33 mentions Daniel, although not by name. He speaks about the other prophets and what they went through and how some shut the mouths of lions. That, of course, is speaking about the prophet Daniel. There are six major kingdoms that Daniel speaks about. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Media Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, and the kingdom of God. You need to know these six kingdoms because they're going to come up over and over again. They're going to start straight away as we get into our second chapter and we're going to see varying facets of them all the way through chapter 12. So how did this happen? How did the Assyrians take power around 900 B.C.? Well, we go back and we consider 
who was in power before that. And believe it or not, it was that tiny little country called Israel under the leadership of King David and then King Solomon. Israel grew to its largest extent under King Solomon. Note, however, that they did not, that is, they did not possess all of the land that God promised to Abraham. So the Abrahamic covenant in the land that they received was never fully fulfilled. So 900, about 950 is the end of Solomon's reign. His son Rehoboam takes over. Rehoboam is a bonehead. And rather than listening to the people and the older wise counselor, he gets all his buddies alongside and makes some ridiculous statements. The nation divides in 930 B.C., that leaves a power vacuum and whoosh, the Assyrians rush in. The Assyrians are thought to be one of the most brutal races ever in the history of the ancient world. They were the ones who invented crucifixion. Only it was through the strict impaling of the offender on a pole and then standing him there as his body was decapitated. 900 is about when they began. 721 is the year we want to know for our purposes. This is when the Assyrians came and took the northern ten tribes captive. 721 B.C. They continued on to 612. What gave way for this huge powerful army, Nineveh being the capital, to fall apart, that the Babylonians could come in? Well, you might remember a little interaction from one good king, Hezekiah. And the Assyrians had come to take Jerusalem. Hezekiah goes to Isaiah the prophet and pleads to him on behalf of Sennacherib's attack and that he would destroy the nation. And God says that in one night his army will be destroyed. And you will remember that in one night, three different locations in the Bible that it's described, that the angel of the Lord, who we know to be the pre-incarnate Christ, came as the judging angel and destroyed 185,000 in the Assyrian army in one night. He decimated their army. That happened around 680 B.C. The Assyrians stumbled along for a while. Babylon grew and grew. And under Nebuchadnezzar's father, Nabopolassar, they went and they captured Nineveh and destroyed it. By the way, you'll read about that in the book of Nahum, the prophet to Nineveh. And in 625, they took Nineveh, the capital city. And by 612, the Assyrian nation was defunct. Babylon had risen to power. And we see Babylon's reign from 612 to 539. What happened in 539? You're going to read about it. Because that's what happens between chapters 5 and chapter 6 of Daniel. When we see the last king of the Babylonian empire, Belshazzar, the foolish one, who decides he's going to have a big old party for his buds and brings out all of the gold vessels that are meant for the temple of Yahweh and starts drinking out of them and having a big time. And we have a little handwriting on the wall that doesn't go well for him. So we'll see more about that. He is destroyed. The Babylonian Empire with him. The Medes and Persians rise up. And we see their dominance until 331 with Alexander the Great. To 146 when the Roman Empire rises. As uh, we see Alexander killed Quite early on, his four generals try and hold it together, but they're really just fighting for one another. And eventually the Romans take over. And the final kingdom, of course, is the kingdom of God. And all of this repeatedly described for us in the book of Daniel. And this is fascinating stuff. Okay. Whew. Questions? Cries of shock? <laughs> Outrage? Yes, well, there's, there's so much, I know. I hope this is the hardest lesson I have to prepare for. This thing killed me. <laughs> but it's important to start to understand some of these pieces. You need to see what's happening with the kings. You need to see what's happening with the kingdoms. Because in all of this, God is bringing together 
really from the, the beginning of Israel's kingship and dynasty under King David all the way until the eternal state, the conclusion of time. I mean, everything is here, and it, and it is amazing to understand it. But in all seriousness, any questions or anything that was totally sideways, he went, whoa, what? Okay, yes, Greg. As always, you're ahead of me, and yes, you're right. His question was, is it chapter 2 where we have the vision of the statue with the four parts? And in these four parts, every one of these kingdoms is brought forward. Now, the Assyrians are not because they're gone. I wanted you to understand them for context. But the Babylonians, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, and most of all, the kingdom of God is brought forward for us in chapter 2. Yes, excellent. And for those of you that want to study, that you don't want to put your hand up, those of you at home, if you have questions, email them to me. I would love to interact with you about this as we move along. So these are the major kingdoms. Who knows where I am in my notes at this time? Um, but we, we see the entire chronology of the Jewish captivity begins effectively in Daniel 1.1. This is the beginning of the end. This is where everything launches from. And, and that's important for us to recognize these many prophetic details and the individuals that are here. And I think that's enough for our discussion of the itinerary and the individuals. Obviously, there will be many more characters and we'll discuss more about the time frame as we move along. So let's go to our third point then, the prophetic infrastructure, kind of that which surrounds it. And we've touched on this some already. But what we want to recognize is address that what, first off, what is a prophet? What's a prophet? How do, how do we know what a prophet is? Anybody got a guess? What would you say if I, I wanted a definition of a prophet? What would you say? A pro-proclaimer of the Word of God, someone who proclaims the Word of God prior to its happening. Excellent definition. Someone who speaks for God. That's what a prophet is. Now, it's interesting to understand that as we look at most of the prophets, major and minor, Daniel's unique. Most of the prophets receive, revela they receive revelation from God that is mostly judgmental, regarding the nation in their wickedness and is calling for them to change. Daniel's not that way. Daniel does receive visions from God. There are elements of judgment in it, but it's not direct revelation interacting immediately with the people of Israel. Because of that, hold on to your seats, in the Hebrew Bible, Daniel is not listed with the prophets He's in the writings. There are three sections to the Hebrew Bible. There's the Torah, so the first five books of the law or of Moses. There are the prophets, the second section. Jesus refers to them in this order. And then the writings. Daniel is in the writings because he is never called a prophet anywhere in the book. He is called a seer and he is called a wise man. And because of that, the Hebrew scholars decided to put his book with the prophets, or excuse me, with the writings. However, it couldn't be anywhere further from the proper place here at the hinge between the major and minor prophets because it is all about those major prophets. So if, to use the definition, and I might mess it up, so help me if I do, that a prophet is a pro-proclaimer of God's word, which is accurate, then prophecy is simply those details which are brought forward orally or in written fashion. Seems simple enough, but it is so important for us to understand and to grasp that this is what a prophet is. There's something else about a prophet. A prophet is one who every time he speaks, his words are 100% true and accurate. Let me give you an example from 1 Kings 
chapter 22 and verse 13. A prophet by the name of Micaiah. Micaiah, 1 Kings 22 and 13. This is during the time of Ahab and Jehoshaphat. They have a conclave where they are going to go attack Moab and the rest of the countries around trying to regain power. And the Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah and Benjamin, comes to the northern ten tribes king, wicked Ahab, and, says, and, and Ahab says, we're going to win. And all Ahab's prophets are dancing around and saying, oh yeah, king, live forever, you're going to win, we're going to take him down. And Jehoshaphat goes, you know, that's really nice, but do you have a prophet of the Lord? Because in all of the statements, a prophet is one who is 100% accurate. And Ahab goes, oh, there's this one guy, but he never speaks anything good about me. His name's Micaiah, and, um, but we'll get him. So they go to Micaiah, verse 13. The messengers who went to summon Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Behold, now the words of the prophets are uniformly favorable to the king. Please let your word be like the word of one of them and speak favorably. But Micaiah said, As the Lord lives, what the Lord says to me, that I shall speak. When he came to the king, the king said to him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle or shall we refrain? And he answered him, go up and succeed and the Lord will give it into the hands of the king. And you think, well, wow, if he's a prophet and he only spoke the truth, why did he say that? Oh, there was one little phrase that wasn't there. Thus saith the Lord. Well, Ahab's immediately on that. In verse 16, the king said to him, How many times must I adjure you to speak to me nothing but the truth in the name of the Lord? And then Micaiah lowers the boom and says, You're done, Ahab. Brings this horrific prophecy and Ahab says, Take him and feed him bread and water until I return. And Micaiah says, If you return, I am not a prophet of the Lord because you're done. And he was. So this is what we understand about a prophet. They speak only that which comes from God. It is the spoken word of God to his people. Interestingly, as we mentioned, Daniel is not part of that due to no specific mention as a prophet. Again, a legalistic perspective. As commentator Paul Tanner notes, Daniel did not play a mediatorial role between God and the nation like other prophets. He was not the go-between, he was not the voice and the mouthpiece of God to specific individuals, such as Nathan, who God sent to David to rebuke him for his sin against Bathsheba and his murder of Uriah. And all of the other prophets. Daniel is unique in that regard. So let's talk about the book itself. Now, you've all been in the Old Testament survey class, and I know you're experts because you learned so well from what we talked about, right? Good, that's what I wanted to hear. So as we think about the book of Daniel, who can tell me a little bit about this picture? What's this picture about? What's in the picture? A lion. Yep. What, what else? Daniel in the lion's den. Yes, that's right. We have Daniel in the lion's den. We have this picture reminding us that Daniel, and notice Daniel's name laying next to the lion. Daniel's having a dream counting lions instead of sheep. That, that's when you know you've got great confidence. And the guy next to him didn't fare so well. So this is the book of Daniel. Can somebody tell me what the theme of the book of Daniel is based on our little picture here? What's that little cloud represent? A dream. That's right. The book of Daniel is a book of dreams. Had another slide. That's all right. It's gone. Another theme is is destiny. So we could say dreams or destiny is the one word that gives us the theme of the whole book of Daniel. The outline for the book is there for you in two parts. History, chapters 1 to 6. Prophecy, chapters 7 to 12. Very important for us to focus on. Now let's go one step further. I know you've been reading. I've been talking to several of you about it. So 
let's reconstruct the chapter outline for the book of Daniel. Well, I already gave you chapter 1, Daniel's history in Babylon. You'd have gotten that anyway. But how about chapter 2? What's chapter 2 of Daniel about? Somebody in the back row. Mr. Wood, what's chapter 2 about? Yeah, the vision of the four-part statue. Excellent. Nebuchadnezzar's four-part statue dream. How about chapter 3? Ah, the fiery furnace, that's right. And the 90-foot gold statue. 90 feet tall statue of gold. How much gold does that take? A lot. A lot, a lot. Yeah, that's right. Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue in the furnace. How about chapter 4? Pressing a little harder here. Pardon? The time in the field, that's right. Nebuchadnezzar's tree dream and the cow king. That's right, Nebuchadnezzar gets sent out into the grass because he's unwilling to acknowledge God as the one who has given him all his power. Excellent. Chapter 5, we already talked about it. That's right, handwriting on the wall, Belshazzar's wall in the hand. Chapter 6, you guys are excellent. It's the transition, yes? The lion's den, that's right. It's Darius and Daniel in the lion's den. Remember I told you the transition between kingdom from Babylon to the media Persians is between chapters 5 and 6. And there it is, chapter 6, King Darius is the king of the Medes. It is Darius the Mede. This might be something that would take you back to our study of Esther and that handout that I gave you that showed you the kings of Media and Persia. And you would remember that there were two kings that were concurrent for a short time in Persia and Media. And the king of Persia was Cyrus, the man who Isaiah named 150 years before his birth by name as the one who would issue the decree for Israel to return to Jerusalem. That signifies the end of the 70 years that started in 605 and which we read about in chapter 9. Let's keep going. Chapter 7. This is where they get really exciting. What is Daniel chapter 7 about? Four beasts, exactly. Daniel and the four beasts. Chapter 8, similar. Pardon? Pardon? The ram, the goat, and the little horn. Chapter 9, somebody's got to help Vicky. Here's a biggie. When we think of Daniel, we think primarily of this chapter. What is chapter 9? The 70 weeks, exactly. Chapter 10? This is where Daniel was struggling a little bit. And he had a little help by the preparation by Michael, the archangel. Chapter 11 of Daniel. We went from 70 weeks to one less, 69. That's right. So look at the parallels that are happening. As we're moving into this prophecy that begins in chapter 7, the future proclamation of what's going to happen, notice the repetition that's coming forward. As we see the 70 weeks, the 69 weeks, we see the beasts, the, the four beasts, the ram, the goat, the little horn. All of this is interactive. All of this interconnected. Chapter 12, the final chapter is Daniel's sealing of the book and the end. Daniel is interestingly written in two different languages. It is written in Hebrew and Aramaic. Chapter 1 to chapter 2, 4 is in Hebrew. Chapter 8, verse 1 to the end is in Hebrew. The center section in 2, 5 to 7, 28 is Aramaic. Why? It's right, Nebuchadnezzar. It's the language of the people. The common language, the lingua franca was Aramaic. It's what was spoken across the ancient world. It started clear back with the Assyrians. In fact, it started before that, somewhere around 3000 BC in the area of Aram, modern northern Iraq, a place that is just north of Haran, 
where Abraham went after he left Ur of the Chaldeans and with his father Tehran, and they went to Haran, and this area where this language began in Aram, hence Aramaic, was just north of there. Some will uh, say that uh, Aramaic is also the language that the New Testament was written in. No, it was not. Did Jesus speak Aramaic? Absolutely. Did Jesus speak Hebrew and Greek and every other language? Yeah, absolutely. But it was not written in that. Many who will do so, do so out of an errant hermeneutic perspective, attempting to deny the miraculous accounts that are written in the Scripture. So it was the contemporary language and where everything came from. Daniel is taken into captivity when he's very young, 13 to 16 years old, and he is taken off. He is attested to, as we mentioned, by Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and also, as we mentioned, by the author of Hebrews, but most importantly, perhaps, by the Lord himself in Matthew 24 and 15. Note that verse, you're going to want to study it. Matthew 24 and verse 15. It relates to three different sections in Daniel. Here's where you're going to see more of our interconnectivity of these different chapters. It relates to Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, Daniel chapter 11 and verse 31, and Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1. 927, 1131, and 121. Daniel is the Old Testament parallel of, the, of Revelation, truly, and, and it all connects with Matthew 24. Knowing your Bibles and your New Testaments as the good scholars and Bereans that you are, what's Matthew 24 and 25? The Olivet Discourse. It is Jesus' proclamation of the end times. What a perfect place for Daniel to jump right in in a prominent way. Critical for us to understand all these details. A couple verses I want you to note also in addition to those from Daniel. Daniel 2 and verse 44 where we see the sovereignty of God mightily proclaimed. Daniel chapter 7 and verse 13 where we have the Son of Man presented to the Ancient of Days. Very important prophetic vision. Daniel 9 and 24, we just spoke about the vision of the 69 weeks, pinpointing the coming of Messiah. We will pinpoint that coming and show you how that comes through, Daniel. And then Daniel 12 and 1, the Old Testament resurrection reference. Some say, oh, well, there's nothing in the Old Testament that talks about the resurrection of the righteous and the wicked. Daniel 12, 1 specifically does so and perfectly parallels John chapter 5. So note those different references and, and all the things that are there. there there's so many pieces uh, of Daniel. He, he prophesies, prophesies to the Gentile word, Gentile world, rather, talking about their dominion and that there would be a greater conqueror coming in Messiah. And it's fantastic to recognize that many of the Old Testament prophet, prophets spoke about how Israel would return to prominence, how she would defeat all of her enemies. Some that have an errant view of eschatology will say, oh, well, that happened in 70 A.D., Really? I think Israel was nearly destroyed in 70 AD. And we ask ourselves, has there ever been a time from the writing of Daniel beginning in 605 BC to today where Israel had domination over her enemies? No! Not even close! Which means that either God's word's wrong or those who think that the church has replaced Israel are wrong. Because Israel will return to her place of dominance and Daniel is going to tell us all about it. He writes to encourage the exiles in God's redemptive plan and their return after the Gentile dominion. 
it's wonderful to look even back at our text in Daniel chapter 1, which we read, and verse 2, where we see Daniel proclaim, if I can get my fingers to work here as I walk through the yellow pages, the Lord, Daniel 1 and verse 2, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hands along with some of the vessels of the house of God. And it goes on. Who did it? The Lord did it. God is sovereignly directing this right out of the chute. And we're going to see it over and over again. What an amazing message for us to understand. We're going to see the proclamation of Messiah in chapter 2 and chapter 7 and chapter 9. It's amazing for us to understand all that God is showing us in this wonderful timetable. To see Daniel's dedication to God as an example for us to follow. To see the power of prayer and how God responds. To see God's authority over all of the rulers perfectly in line with Romans 13. And to describe the prophetic periods of time of the Gentiles as Luke 21, 24 tells us. This is indeed a momentous introduction. And we're going to see tremendous details of God's redemptive plan. But even above that, we're also going to better understand how to excel in holiness in the face of direct and radical opposition to our faith. Do you think that's something we need to know in our day and age? I think it critically is, and I'm so thankful for one of our elders recommending that this is the direction that we go so that we would understand that regardless of what comes before us, we have an example of how we are to live in this world and how we are to carry forth and how we are to encourage one another and stand strong in our faith. And I pray that as we continue down this path, God will encourage each of you in all that you see from this incredible book. Let's pray. Father, thank you for our time. Thank you for your love and your goodness. Thank you for the glory that you reveal to us even in, in the first portions of this fantastic book. Lord, encourage our hearts and strengthen us that we would see your work in each and every verse, Father, in each and every word, because we know each word, each syllable, each vowel and consonant is inspired by you to us so that we would know how better to live and to bring you the honor and glory that you alone deserve. Thank you for the blessing of this book. Glorify yourself in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for being here.